just going to sort of go through a little bit of thinking from the data science side and hope that it'll be a window into how data scientists think and what questions you can ask or how you can approach working with data scientists um, and how to create a more useful relationship with them. That's sort of the larger goal of the talk. Uh, it's going to be a little bit interactive, so I'm going to expect a little bit from you guys. Uh, we'll do some warm-up exercises, some kind of thought exercises where you guys can just yell out ideas, and I'll try and feel those ideas, problematize them a little bit, and uh, hopefully we can get some cool new features built together, and then we can look at how a data scientist might affect your thought process. First thing I'm going to talk about is myself. Like Shauna said, had sort of a very winding path to the destination I'm at right now. Not sure if this is the final one, but I started out studying applied math in school. Uh, that was after sort of studying religion for a little bit. After I studied applied math for a couple of years, I ended up working at a laboratory in Texas at the University of Houston. Uh, University of Texas, sorry, the University of Texas at Houston Health Sciences Center, uh, where I did research on modeling retinal neurons and salamanders. So that's the reason for this slide. I did that while I was an undergrad and ended up sort of getting to know a lot more about data science and engineering and ended up publishing a paper on that uh, and then graduating uh, after that and turning down a job in the lab because it was 2008, the economy had just crashed, and I went to an expensive school. So <laughs> I had to go and make a little bit more money than the lab could offer, which led me into industry for a year. I worked at a startup in New York that does or used to do uh, advertising a little bit. It, it, they had a catalog or a library of different categories of advertising. And what we would do is try to match a video with that category and find someone who wanted to have a video produced. And then we would blast it all over the web and try and optimize it. So it was sort of like video optimization, SEO optimization. And that's sort of where I first started to get into engineering. Um, and that was a big shift away from data science and more uh, hardcore engineering, learning how to build a maintainable system. Um, also communicating outputs from that system to stakeholders. So that, that sort of went pretty well until I got the offer from a friend to come to South by Southwest uh, touring with his band as a childhood friend. So I quit after nine months and decided that I would use what I learned in engineering to, to be a freelancer and uh, be a musician full time for about four or five years. Uh, and in that time, I did a bunch of stuff. I did some website design, building lots of website, front end, back end, uh, you name it, mostly stuff on sort of a smaller scale. Um, if any of you are freelancers, you probably know what that's like. Um, kind of take what you can get. And after doing that for a while and the music thing kind of not paying the bills as much as I would like, I decided that I was going to transition into a more serious engineering role, which then led me to a newspaper called the New York Times. Through a friend of a friend, ended up getting an interview there and somehow got a job there. I worked in their data science and uh, data science and data engineering group. That was the first time I ever had to really start thinking about computer science and data on the level of not just a locale, a country, but on a global scale. Uh, so this was a huge education for me. And I kind of cut my teeth at the New York Times and credited it as sort of like my second college experience. So after two and a half years at the New York Times working with their data group, uh, my boss from that company left and went to Spotify. And uh, that's where I am currently. So I'll just give you a, a brief overview of the team I'm on at Spotify. Uh, I'm on a team called Data Solutions. And we sort of do a lot of cross-functional work. That's our mission charter, is just to do as much cross-functional work as we can at the company in places where there's sort of a lack of cross-functional expertise. Uh, so I'm a data scientist on that team. And I sort of embed with a lot of different teams for short amounts of time and try and 
help them where they're lacking data science capability. Uh, so this leads me to work with all kinds of people at the company, all different disciplines. Uh, it's, it's somewhat unique. We do have mostly cross-functional teams at Spotify, but um, most of them are sort of dedicated to one business output or dedicated to a product uh, or part of the product. So uh, I have a lot more of an aerial view of the company in this role, which has been really exciting. Um, so I don't know. Can I get a show of hands? And you know, you don't have to lie. Is there, how many people are Spotify users here? Is that true? That's, that's amazing. Um, how many of you got your 2017 rap campaign last year? Eh, some of you. Um, OK, for those of you that don't know, uh, the images sort of tell you what it was. It was a data story campaign. And what we did was we looked at, we, we formed data stories for each user uh, around their behavior. And we had uh, stories for premium users and stories for free users. This was a very educational experience for me. I joined the company and was sort of thrown into this project immediately uh, as the, since I have a data engineering background, Sorry, I forgot to mention that. At the New York Times, I was a data engineer. So uh, because of my data, data engineering background and my back end experience and front end experience and data science experience, I was sort of tasked with doing most of those things um, for this campaign. And it was a very exciting thing to be thrown into. Uh, but it was also a good experience working with designers. Uh, it, was, it was not my first time, because there is some of that at the New York Times. but. Uh, it was it was a little bit different. The culture is different, uh, but it was kind of I, I learned a lot, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today came out of learnings from that experience. Let's talk about one of the problems that can happen when you're doing design and data science and other sort of functions in a business in the least or not the least, but a suboptimal manner. These are the silos. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard about silos before, this is not revelatory, but it does still happen. Um, and it is one of the biggest focuses of what I want to talk about today. I want to sort of get into and give you a sense for how involving different disciplines in the process, in the creative process, can help enrich it and inform the direction it goes in uh, from the, from the get-go. Uh, whereas a lot of times, in my experience, there are, there's sort of the staggered execution of these disciplines where uh, creative might be going off on its own to come up with a campaign idea or a feature idea. Um, and oftentimes there's a lot of pressure from the creative management to keep the creative isolated or insulated from people who might sort of disrupt their process with uh, too many doses of, well, we can't do this or we can't do that because of x, y, and z. Um, but I want to make an argument against that kind of thinking. Uh, and hopefully, through the exercises we do together, you'll agree with me. Does everybody know what T-shaped means? OK, that's sort of an engineering term, so I'll just flesh it out when I get there. But uh, my first belief is basically that all frameworks suck, even the best ones. Frameworks are like democracy in that sense. You know, democracy is the worst kind of government, except for all the other ones. Frameworks are the same way. Frameworks are maps, and maps are not the terrain. So I, I do see and have experienced people in my ex work experience who um, get those things confused or are too religious about some kind of framework, agile being one of them that comes to mind. Um, they are useful, but they have to be sort of tempered by, uh, by edge cases where they don't necessarily apply, and they shouldn't be applied too strictly. Uh, the second one is that des design decisions are ultimately business decisions. It's easy to lose sight of that stuff when you're down in the weeds. That also happens in engineering and data science. You can really forget about the fact that everything that you do does tie back to a bottom line at some point. Uh, and it's actually helpful to, at least from my perspective, to keep that in mind when you are doing whatever it is you are tasked with doing whether it's data science or design or engineering. Three, the best companies are already design companies principally, or they eventually have to develop that capability. For example, Tesla, Apple, 
in my mind, those companies are really just design companies. Um, that's, that's what they do is they create visions and products that are things people haven't seen before. Um, and then they sort of build in the tech and do a lot of amazing other stuff. Uh, whereas something like Facebook or Google or Amazon, and if you guys are designers, I'm sure everybody who, even if you're not a designer, you can tell that like Amazon's products were horrible and ugly for a very long time. Uh, even their cloud products that a lot of engineers use, or the, the UI and UX is just like atrocious. Um, but as they've grown, they're now like definitely adding those capabilities. We work a lot with Google and I've seen over time, because the New York Times also worked with Google and their cloud products, we've seen over time that they're really focusing on design as a discipline and trying to make their cloud products much more user friendly and a much more aesthetically pleasing uh, experience than say Amazon's products. And then the number fourth one is like we, we passed the point where not being T-shaped is tenable. And what I mean by T-shaped is in engineering, T-shaped is just like a, a buzzword for people who have a very deep knowledge of one subject and then also a very wide and not as deep subject or knowledge of, of other subjects. Um, so if you're a data engineer, you might be very good at distributed systems, um, but you should probably have a knowledge of back-end engineering and front-end engineering. Um, so this is something that a lot of companies, I think, are striving for in the engineering realm. Um, and I think it's also probably, I would like to argue, important for designers to sort of stretch themselves too uh, and become a little bit more T-shaped um, and cross-functional so that they can work well with, with data scientists or engineers. Uh, so when I was doing this talk, I was looking for resources to copy. Um, and one thing I found was there was a recently published article in Harvard Business Review by IDEO. Uh, it was about an exercise product that they built. And it was really about a lot about what this talk is about, which is they they went the opposite direction that I've experienced, where they built a product that was very data driven and had a lot of dashboards, a lot of numbers, uh, and they exposed that data to users thinking that that would be helpful to users. But what ended up happening was that the users felt overwhelmed by that data. They didn't find it useful. They didn't think the experience was good. So the designers were brought in after the fact to try and make uh, sort of different decisions about how to use the data or hide the data or think more about behavior than just about displaying metrics to people uh, with a lot more success in the product. This is sort of a quote that came out of it um, that I fully agree with, but that scenario also kind of demonstrates one of the problems that I'm going to keep harping on this whole talk, which is that they had one group of people do one thing first. And then when that didn't work, they had another group of people with a different discipline come in and try to correct that problem. Obviously, that's not an optimal way because you're just burning resources that you could have had uh, saved if you had optimized for having the cross-functional team work on this product together. Uh, so let's do a little warm up. Basically, pick your favorite streaming service. It can be whatever you want. Uh, and let's say, first I want you to think about like what data you might have available to you on that platform about a user, and then pair it with weather data. So take your music streaming platform of choice and imagine that you had all this data about your users and then you have weather data that you can join to that data. Does anybody have any first thoughts on what kind of a feature you could get out of that that might be interesting? Rainy day, slow songs. Okay. Rainy day, slow songs, moods based on weather. Anything else? Those are good. Okay. That's a cool one. Um, all right. So let's move on to another one. I'll get back to some of my way of thinking about those ideas uh, after we do another exercise. So um, now let's pair streaming with people's calendars. Um, so what? What ideas do you guys have there? I say playlists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So these are all great ideas, and they also give me some 
fuel <laughs> to burn. So this is often something I've seen when designers sort of like ideate and think about these things without sort of the data perspective. Um, the more personalized stuff doesn't, isn't affected by this problem as much, but broad features for a lot of people are. Um, data scientists sort of think in pictures and shapes a lot like designers do, uh, and our pictures and shapes are just more graphs and data visualizations. Uh, and here's one thing that kind of I anticipated might happen. Uh, you might design your feature around some metric uh, that you think looks like this. Um, and, and, and by this, I mean this is a distribution of data in that feature or a distribution of data across all your features. Um, it would be great if this, was, if this was the case. You have a completely homogenous data distribution for the people you're designing for. So a one-size-fits-all feature would be great. When we're talking about weather, and we're talking about playing things on rainy days or sunny days or based on humidity, um, I'll get back to that in a second, actually. <laughs> First, let me just say, your data might actually look like this. Does this mean anything to anybody? This, if, if this is the distribution of the data you're basing your feature on, uh, you have this sort of bimodal distribution is the technical term. And if you look at this, you'll see that most of the mass of people's usage or whatever the feature is, is centered around these sort of two lines. Uh, and then you have these tails that sort of meet in the middle. And uh, what that might mean is that you have two groups of people in your user base who are very extremely separated on a behavior. Uh, and then you have a bunch of people in the middle who don't do anything. Uh, and in that case, trying to design features gets very difficult and problematic. And coming up with data stories gets difficult and problematic. Uh, and that's where I think really having the perspective of a, of a data scientist or thinking like a data scientist as a designer can be very impactful and powerful. So it gets worse, too. Think about when you have to design for different time zones. So if this is your user base, um, you might have to think about what's happening in different time zones that might affect the data. Uh, you also have to think about geography. When you're talking about weather, some people might live in places that are never humid. They never rain. Uh, then what do you do for those people? Then you can't really extend the feature to them. Or you have to think about how you can modify your idea to fit those people's use cases. It gets way worse when you start to think about scaling across time zones, languages, cultures, etc. Now you're in this situation. Now how do you start designing features for your user base, especially at scale, when you're talking about millions, maybe hundreds of millions, billions of users, if you think about a company like Facebook? Um, one, one solution that you guys kind of hit on instinctively was full personalization, right? So just stuff that only makes sense to that user shows up for that user. Uh, and, and that's definitely one thing you can do, but it's not always, it's, it's not always the way you want to go, when, especially when you have something like I showed earlier, like the Wrapped campaign, where you're trying to come up with something unifying about your product uh, that will make users feel part of a larger whole. Um, so not to get into even the difficulties of like cross-cultural stuff, you know, like if you're in the Middle East versus India, can you, what kind of imagery can you show people that's acceptable in that culture? What kind of songs can you suggest to them? Like, it just gets very, very complicated very quick. So this is just sort of like how I think most data scientists think, but I only know that I think this way. Um, so I can't extend this to everybody, but like I was saying earlier, I, I, I have come to think about the world in distributions and these distributions inherently contain a lot of variance. Um, and by variance, I just mean variety. I mean, you guys have probably taken some statistics at some point, so I don't think I'm getting too technical, but uh, that there's a lot of variety in data and a lot of variance in the data. And that's sort of how I would approach thinking through designing features or coming up with products, any of these processes. It's really, you have to look at the data first. You have to figure out who you're targeting. Uh, you have to think about edge cases in that data. And that's really the skill set of a data scientist. And it's not something I think is, I mean, it's the skill set of a data scientist in the context of design. Um, it's not something that I think is that hard for people who aren't data scientists to master. 
I, I hope that like what I'm presenting today will kind of give people the basic skill set to go into any environment with a data scientist or without one and try to actually think these things through. Because um, I mean, you would be surprised that you, you know, like even large companies will miss this stuff sometimes and will have a very hard time designing something for most of the people on the platform. This is just a continuation of this idea is that the way to deal with that stuff is that you try to segment your users into manageable distributions that sort of have predictable shapes, which can be leveraged to maximize performance. You try to tame these differences. You try to put people in boxes and design for them directly. You know, that's a very simple way to say it. It gets very complicated when you're actually doing it. But uh, if you are thinking about designing something as a designer and you don't have a data scientist, you know, the kind of questions you can ask are like, uh, is there any way to break up these users into manageable, predictable buckets that, are, that have a good separation from each other so that we can design more specifically to them? Um, again, obviously full personalization might be an option. It might not. It just depends on the product. Uh, and full personalization has its own set of issues that I'm going to touch upon a little bit later when I talk about testing. So now with this knowledge, how could we have done better at the outset with this? What, what, what could we have thought about? Geography, so that's, that's a good one. Location, you know, you have your designers who are tasked with sort of thinking outside of the box. You have your data and engineering teams who are sort of defining and constantly reinforcing what the box is and trying to keep things anchored in reality um, and what's possible. You have business that has its own set of concerns and then you have your users uh, whom everybody should be making the number one focus of what they're doing, but everyone probably knows it's a little more complicated than that in reality. Um, but this is just to say that uh, these things should not be siloed in people's minds. Even if you work in a siloed business with like verticals that don't communicate, uh, it's very useful to not let that affect the way you think about the product. This is also to say that I think you know data and engineering should should be, and especially data, should be considered like its own part of the business and its own function. Um, and in in that way, if it hasn't traditionally been integrated into the decision making process, it definitely should. Although, of course, most companies are going crazy with data fever right now. So just to get back to this image, this is a thing that we really want to avoid. And like I said earlier, it's either, it's not only a state of mind, it's also uh, a practice. Um, so just to drive home the point again, <laughs> another recommendation I would give is just to try and come up with a process that constructively includes data scientists as early as possible. Because what can happen is like what we just experienced, where people can go off and spend a lot of time coming up with super cool ideas uh, without really thinking about what data you might have available. And it's a good thing to do that. And that's why I say coming up with a process that's constructive is really the challenge. Uh, you don't want someone in the room shooting down every idea and killing the creative process. Uh, you don't want to overfit to using data to build your product or come up with a vision for it. But it is important to have some anchor in, in the data world at some point. So um, I can't say I know exactly how that process should work, but I think it should be something that's discoverable for most companies given their culture. They can probably find a way to do it, maybe just have the data scientists sit out the initial round and then come in after and sort of help pare down the ideas. That's sort of, in my experience, worked pretty well. Um, but the thing to really avoid is staggering those, uh, sta staggering that, that exercise uh, in a serial manner instead of having everybody in the room at the same time. Um, again, this is the, the, the image that we want to avoid. The second point is just the first point, and the second, third, and fourth points are still just the first point. Really, 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 like th this, this does happen. I don't know if you have a, had experience with that in your personal work, but um, really try hard at your place of work, if you can, to try and involve the right people at the right time. I do, I, I do want to say that um, if it isn't clear, I've experienced this personally in my work, um, where there's been 
a feature that needs to be designed or a campaign that needs to be run. And I have actually been told by creative directors before, like we need to protect the design team from any kind of corrupting influences and let them think and be free. Um, and while, again, I respect that, um, ultimately in most of those situations, it just doesn't work out well. <laughs> Uh, again, you end up having wasted effort and having to actually do what you should have done in the first place and have the person who has the data insight ideate with the designers and embed with them. It's a cultural mind shift where those people have to understand the sort of broader ecosystem they're a part of in the business and that everybody is extending themselves. Like, it's an extension for the creative team to even trust to let this person come into the process, uh, knowing that that person might, is probably more prone to shooting down ideas than the, the rest of the people who don't think like that person. There's so much nuance to the pipeline of collecting data, transforming data, getting it into the right place, getting it aggregated and partitioned without losing it, <laughs> without corrupting it, and then analyzing it, running it through models, or doing some complex querying that does further aggregations on it, and not having a bug in your query or a bug in your code along any of those dimensions, especially at scale. I, I, I think every data scientist who's worth their salt should, should take a grain of salt with the data that they're working with, because there are just so many points of failure along the way, and you can't treat your data or your tool set as a religion. Again, like it's a framework. It's not true. Nothing you can do with data is true. And there are also sort of like different types of truth. Uh, like an aesthetic truth is also a truth. Um, and it also might be measurable. And I'm kind of get into this in a minute after we talk about testing. So I'm glad you asked the question. But um, that's a hard one because people who really believe that Maybe at small scale, the data is reliable, and there are fewer points of failure, and that's the environment you're in. Um, but even then, I would argue that people who believe that they can give you an exact answer because of the data don't really understand the complexity of data and what can go wrong. And how you're, I mean, there's a million things I could say about that. But I think there has to be a cultural shift in the mindset of that person. They have to somehow be re-educated or exposed. Maybe they should have come to the talk. Um, <laughs> so having us in the room actually helped the design process because we said, well, so it was more like a give and take where a designer would say, well, what if we have this story? And then we would say, OK, that's cool. But for most people, that story might not work, but we have we could do this with that idea. We could slightly modify the data. So there was, there was some story, I can't remember exactly, but there's some story about uh, genre and age that we did. Um, and they wanted to just sort of talk about genre listening or like your most popular genre, um, or maybe the genre you listen to that's in your age group. And then we sort of started to riff and talk about like, OK, well, we could look at over-indexing or under-indexing on age and genre. Like, are you outside of the norm for your age group? Or um, are, you in, are you in the norm for your age group? What's the spread? So that was like a story that we came up with. Neither party had the right answer at the beginning. So it was a, it was a matter of both people bringing their ideas to the table and saying, like, here's what we know, and here's how we can modify that idea to make it work. Um, so I think it's actually oftentimes more, in my experience, but again, this might be cultural, and I might be biased by where I work and where I have worked. But in my experience, it's, it's more of that than it is people just shooting things down. And to me, that's also like, as a social human, more of a pleasurable experience of a way of working with people. Because I think oftentimes there, there is a better answer if both parties are involved. And there is a better answer if people are both <laughs> extending goodwill and thinking about constructive ways to make the ideas happen rather than being like, no, we can't do that, or no, we can't do this. But I also think on the other side, it's important to not look at somebody problematizing your concept as shooting it down. It might just be them reacting by saying, well, I don't, you know, like, I don't know if we can actually do this, and that's the problem. 
But I wouldn't stop the conversation there. I would sort of like keep going and be like, okay, well, could we modify this idea to work? And I think data and data science and data, it's an art too. And that's why I have a problem with people thinking that it, it, that it's, there's a right answer and they can grab it. Because it's, it's very rarely the case that there's a right or wrong answer. There's so much nuance to data and there's, there's equal amount of nuance, if not more, in, in the creative process. Generally in tech, there's more demand than there is supply for talent. And that's sort of probably what's driving everybody to have to become more T-shaped, you know? It's like, you just have to do more than one person's job. And you'll, you'll be more valuable and you'll do better and you definitely have to work harder and you have to learn more over your lifespan. You can't just learn a skill and be like, cool, I'm a front end engineer, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life uh, and I'll get a paycheck and that's it. Uh, everybody is going to have to stretch and learn different skill sets and if you care about what you're doing and you care about the business outcome um, and you care about, I mean, you have to care about the business you're working for, obviously. Um, but if you really want good outcomes, you want to feel connected to the outcome, I think it's, it's really rewarding to be able to, to stretch the way you think about these things. Uh, how many people are actually engineers or data scientists here? One. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about A-B testing and testing. Um, how many people are familiar with the term A-B testing? Okay, hopefully this is not boring or repetitive or going over stuff you already know. How many people feel like they really understand how it works? Couple. So the basics I think that we all can agree on is that A-B testing is usually testing two groups of people, a control and a treatment, and the biggest point is that they have to be randomized. Um, so it's basically just comes out of scientific studies and it's it's not even a new cool buzzword anymore. Uh, there's a lot of different types of testing that people are doing. Um, I can talk about that if you guys are interested, but I, I wanna go into a little bit of how to visualize A-B testing. So let's, let's go back to our feature that we were building. Let's say that we've figured out our data issues and now we have a feature that we think will work for most people uh, across all of the differences. Or we've segmented the feature up into manageable buckets and we're going to expose people with different segments to different experiences. You really want to have the same distribution across all of your factors in either bucket. So if you think about colored balls, you wanna have, if you were A-B testing on four different colors, you wanna have the same number of each color in, in each bucket. Uh, otherwise you get bias or skew in your test and you won't be able to really say with confidence what happened in your test unless it's really truly randomized. So if you ask someone what does random make you feel, sad, happy, anxious, angry? I think I'm talking about more about like about splitting your audience up into age groups and then testing different things on those age groups. That's something you want to do after you test. You want to just throw people into two buckets and then after that look at what differences you saw within those groups. It's really important that you want each group in your control and your treatment to be representative of the whole population that's using your product. Um, or if you're testing on a segment, you need to make sure that each split, split represents the distribution of your, of your segment. This is like a trope in engineering where it's like, you know, test all the things, unit test things, make sure every feature is tested. And, and it's definitely a good thing to do. And I, I'm gonna talk about why it's good, but I'm also going to talk about why or when it's not great and some problems with it. Uh, but first, just really wanna get into the weeds with A-B testing for a second because it's fun for me. Basically, like we said earlier, A-B testing is testing a control group against a treatment group. So you can think about testing a button color or testing a drug or anything that you want to see the effectiveness of. Let's say you ran a test on your feature, and this is the output of the A-B test when you graph everybody's consumption. Why is there a sad face in the middle? Okay, let's say that I took this data and I was like, okay, cool, this is good. We're gonna release the feature because, I mean, there's some difference here, right? Uh, so let me just go ahead and say that we, we, made it, we, we made some kind of effect. So what I'm sort of getting at is that in this overlapping region, 
if you had a hypothesis about behavior, if you were to reject the null hypothesis, which is your control, and say, so your control is nothing happened, and your hypothesis is something is going to happen. And we'll get into more about hypothesis testing and hypothesis making. But if you were to say, OK, I'm going to go ahead and go with this, uh, the problem with this region is um, you're going to be getting a lot of false positives and false negatives. You'll be rejecting people that you shouldn't reject, and you'll be accepting people that you shouldn't ex accept, or you'll be seeing an effect where you shouldn't see an effect. What you want to do basically, or what you look for in A-B testing is to try and see more separation between these two distributions. In this case, if we look at the treatment group, there's still sort of like an overlapping group here. And this is our treatment group, and we can call this like our, our true positives and our true negatives. So these are the people who had an effect, and these are the ones who didn't have an effect. And then in this area, we have some kind of weird no man's land, where if we say, yes, the treatment worked on this person over here, we're rejecting this part of the overlap. And we're saying, OK, no, it worked. The control group, we we're rejecting the control that nothing happened, something actually happened. Uh, because it's in our treatment group. But you actually can't really tell if it happened or not, because there's this overlapping region. The same thing can happen generally on both sides. You can falsely reject, or you can falsely accept. And this unhappy region is where you get into that problem. So what you really look for in A-B testing is this kind of spread of your distributions. So there, there will always be this overlapping area. You, you'll never get a perfect separation of behavior. And that's what, that's what significance really is. It's setting, when you, when at the outset of your testing, you're saying, I want a certain level of significance to be confident about my outcomes. You're trying to set how big this area can be in order to make a judgment of, yes, the, yes this worked, or no, it didn't. So I, I said I wanted to talk a little bit more about hypotheses. Let's say we built this feature, we released it, we measured something about it. Uh, I'm going to give you some fake numbers that happened. So you released a feature, and you saw that compared to control, consumption went up by 2%. Retention went down by 1%. OK? If you didn't have a hypothesis, what, what, so what do you do with that information? Is that good? Is that bad? It's really important to go into this stuff with a hypothesis that you can falsify from the get-go. Uh, otherwise, I don't know if you guys have, if you, has anyone seen Stephen Colbert's thing on p-hacking, stats and p-hacking? The basic idea is that like some of what happened, you can get a good outcome statistically that's random. And you might choose that and say, oh my god, look, it, it moved, I don't know, reach or engagement or some metric that we, we care about as a company. It's part of our North Star key metrics. But it could have just been random, because you can look at like every single metric that you want to and find one that moved, because statistically, something is going to move. Uh, because just random chance, something will move significantly. So it, it, it's, it's very dangerous, again, to go into these situations. And I, I think it probably applies to design, too to go into these situations without first having a clear hypothesis. And one of the reasons why you want to have a hypothesis is because this ties back in again to like thinking about business value. Because what happens when you build a feature? What are you doing? <laughs> you're spending money. You're investing full-time engineering. You're investing design. So you're making a big investment in whatever you're doing. Like Ideally, you're doing something iterative and agile, and you're making a small investment to start. But you're still using resources, and that's a huge opportunity cost. You could have done something totally different with those resources that might have been better than the thing you chose to do. Uh, so you always need to think when you go into these situations, or this is how, at least from a data scientist perspective, I would encourage people to think about those opportunity costs and about the fact that if you don't have a hypothesis, you will find something to say this moved, but you won't know what to do with that information. Like You need to think before. If this moves 1%, uh, how does that tie into the value of the product? What if it moves 1%, but it's mostly low-value users who used it and moved that metric? Uh, 
Uh, do you still want to pay to have a team maintain that feature and build it out and iterate on it? Uh, so there's, there's going to be some cost to any of these decisions. So at the end of the day, if you don't go into it with a hypothesis, then you're, you're getting into a very dangerous zone where you may make a decision and then after a while see that like this is not working at all <laughs> and you invested and wasted all this time and money. So we talked a little bit earlier about fully per personalized products. This may or may not be relevant to your work, but it might be at one point in your life, so I, I do want to touch upon it. And it's basically that what happens if you're working on something that's fully personalized and you're trying to test a feature? What if that thing that's fully personalized changes all the time? Uh, let's take the New York Times as an example. Let's say we, the New York Times as a company moved to a fully personalized homepage feed. Uh, or Facebook is another example. Fully personalized product. Uh, that changes all the time. What if you want to test variants of that news feed um, per user or per groups of users? Uh, I don't know if it's clear yet, but it can then get very complicated to figure out what is a control. So in these cases, then it, it gets very difficult to try and figure out how to test. Uh, and, and one recommendation if you're ever in that situation and people are trying to figure out what to do is, is to hold out a group of users from the personalized product completely. That's also a huge cost. So I, I, I want to sort of contrast this type of testing with a situation like a Tesla or an iPhone where you can't afford to test because it's expensive. In those realms, it's like very obvious why it's expensive to test, right? Like you have to build a, a hardware thing. You have to like have all these companies build their component of it. You have to like, yeah, invest in all of that stuff, have a whole design process. It's machinery, it's materials. And then like, if you wanted to try and iterate on that design as quickly as you would iterate on something digital, it would cost an enormous amount of money. You can't like recall your Tesla to the dealership for your test group and switch a door out or you know, change the wheels they have. Um, that would just be so expensive if you wanted to do that. But there are costs in the digital realm, too. Um, and personalization brings up one of those where you might have to hold out a group of users to test on to actually know what is happening. But those users then lose out. They don't get the better experience. There's a trade-off with all this testing. It costs something for somebody. Uh, you could also be exposing users. If you didn't do a personalized test, even if we're back in normal A-B testing land, you could also be exposing users to a feature that like, gives them a bad taste for the platform. You know? And that could sort of have some kind of viral PR effect. Um, and then people could start churning in droves because of that viral effect. So I think a lot of people take this stuff lightly, especially when you have a lot of scale and you have a lot of users to test on. Um, so you need to think, about, think carefully about how many people are going to be exposed and what the cost of it is. Because it seems like it's for free online or in the digital realm, but it's actually not for free. It costs something. And again, there's that opportunity cost of what you could have been doing if you didn't decide to test that thing on those users. You can't just burn through your users for forever. This is sort of like the, the linear process we've talked about, um, where you first design concept, some cool feature idea. You design the actual thing, and you build a prototype. You test the prototype against a control with a hypothesis that hopefully actually drove coming up with this feature in the first place. That's not to say that there isn't any value to being exploratory. Like You definitely want to be exploratory. You really want to have a baseline. Let's say you don't have a hypothesis. So in lieu of a hypothesis, what you want to have is something as similar as you can get to that thing that you can compare it to. So there is always a place for exploration. But exploration is going to always be more difficult to make a decision about because you don't have a hypothesis. And you can always find a baseline to compare to, but the baseline product you might compare to might have enough differences that when you actually go ahead and say, this is good, let's release it, in the end, it doesn't work out. Uh, so that's another sort of caveat to the testing mentality. So then the fourth thing is you want to iterate on the learnings you get from one and three. You might be generating new hypotheses. Hopefully you are. And then you keep repeating this process. 
uh, until you've sort of honed this feature, you'll, you'll progressively like roll it out to more people and then split them up and test on them again. Uh, if it's a good feature and it generates a lot more hypotheses, it'll be like a big treasure trove of things that you can use to understand your users more. This is where there are dragons in the, in the, in the number three of the, of the process, uh, testing the prototype against the control. The dragon I want to really talk about is uh, sort of testing inception. So let's say we went back and we built our feature out, and now we're going to test it on our users. First thing we did was design concepting. We didn't design a thing or a look or a graphic or anything. We just designed the concept of this feature, right? So we went through, we designed the concept, and then there's the, the second step of designing the actual thing and building the prototype. So that's where you actually like see how it's going to look and see how it's going to function, and you bring in UX, and you start to build it out. So what can happen in that is then when you get to the testing phase, how do you know whether it was the feature that was good or the design that was good? How would you tell if it's the opposite case, if it was the feature that was good but the design that was bad? So that's when, the, when testing gets very complicated because it becomes very hard to figure out what, what is actually causing the behavior you see. And that's, that's like really, that's really part of why I say data science is not a science completely, it's sort of an art. Like, there's always a mismatch between the, the theoretical conceptual thing you're doing and the reality of it. You can always try to look at how the user interacted with the thing in a different way. You can't always measure exactly how the user inter interacted with your feature. Like, they might have been looking away from the screen when they scrolled past it. Like, you, you just, you can't tell unless you put a chip in their brain and know how they're interacting with your product. Like, there's so many ways to miss that stuff. So, so just getting back to this testing inception, um, it, again, it's difficult to, to tease out the effect of the feature from the designer implementation. If you have a ton of users, you can try to split your users up and test all the different designs you can come up with, test different implementations. Not everybody has that ability. You know, mostly a couple of big, handful of big companies really have enough scale to still split up their users and get significance. It is really difficult sometimes to figure that out. And even if you did split it up, there's still always going to be a what if. Um, there's always a way to problematize what happened, how the people interacted with it, your design, your implementation. So there are no hard and fast rules. And you can't assume because you did it once, it doesn't work forever. Uh, because you're, it, it actually could have been the implementation and the design and not the feature idea itself. And you can never know for sure if it was a design or implementation unless a competitor does this thing and they do it well or better and they maintain the feature. So this is sort of what Apple does with their phones. Uh, Apple hasn't really been innovative in like I don't know, what, 10 or 15 years maybe? Uh, they're kind of coasting on their original success. And what they do is just watch the market for what Android phones do. They see what Samsung releases. They see what they cut. They look for a feature that stays stable over time throughout all these different phones. And they decide, OK, we'll add a thumbprint reader too. And then they try and do it a little bit aptly to make it like, you know, a little better, a little distinctive. But it's actually not something new. It's an example of like, it's basically just taking the risk off of yourself and letting other people take the risk until they've either proved the success or value of that thing and then you build it. So that's one way to test your idea if you have a lot of time and you don't want to take the risk. So again, like testing is a cost and a risk. So if, if you're really risk averse as a company like Apple is, you just want to grow slowly to $1 trillion valuation and you don't care about being the coolest, most innovative, or you have such a great marketing machine that it doesn't matter if your product is that innovative because you can sell <laughs> old shit as new shit to people, <laughs> then, <laughs> then <laughs> hypothetically, yeah. <laughs> then you can take that approach. But even then, I, I would say it's still a problem. Even then, if your competitor does it and they keep the feature and it seems like they're doing well, you still have to think about like how much money they have to maintain that thing, right? You may not have the same constraints as they do. They might have endless amounts of money to throw at keeping the feature around. One example for music streaming. Why does Apple, why do Apple, Google, and, and Amazon even have music streaming? 
do they really care? That's not their core business. It doesn't contribute to their core business. It's actually probably mostly a loss for them. It's not always that clear even if your competitors do it and you failed at doing it, or they do it first and it succeeds, that it will be a value for your company too. And then one more quick thing. I know I'm saying a lot about testing. Let's say the feature complete, we had a hypothesis, the feature tanked, it sucked, didn't work at all, okay? Except you have a small handful of very engaged users who love that feature. Now what do you do? You run your test, you're like, I don't know, it didn't move enough to justify the cost of maintaining this thing. We have a very like engaged set of users who love that thing. What are you gonna do? It, it could also be, that this is a feature that gets seldom used by most people. Like, what if it's a road trip playlist and people want that to be in your app, but they only use it when they go on a road trip? <laughs> and how often are people going on road trips? You know, like if you have like like it was mentioned somewhere about scale. Like if you have incredible scale, like everything that's going to happen will happen. You can probably measure. But in the gray area. And even then, I would argue there are probably, it's probably true that there are things that within your period of measurement might not happen frequently enough for that feature. And you may not know that like pulling that feature affects people's feelings about the product. And this is where, again, like just being a like hard-nosed data person and not really thinking outside of just what the numbers say is problematic. You might pull that and you might affect churn. Like I said, pulling that feature might piss those users off. They might be your most engaged users. Your competitor might release that feature tomorrow and they might not care whether it moves a metric. They have enough money just to maintain it and they think it's a cool feature to have. And then your engaged users leave for that platform and maybe they start pulling other people or the marketing works and then people start jumping because they're like, I mean, a road, list, a road trip playlist probably isn't gonna pull your users away, but it could be that there's an effect you haven't thought of by pulling this feature once you've tested it and it failed. Um, so one way to mitigate that is you, you could then test the effect of removing the feature on those people. It's sort of a meta test. At the end of the test, you say this failed. Now let me split up the people who are using the feature in my treatment group, pull the feature away from half of them and see how they react. Do they churn at a higher rate than the people who I didn't pull the feature from? I just want to go back to this idea. Come up with a process or encourage it wherever your workplace is, a process that constructively includes people who are close to the data as early as possible, and try to make that process safe for everybody and constructive. Um, that, that's really the biggest takeaway from the talk. And, um, just want to thank Shauna, I want to thank 1323 for having me, and I want to thank all of you for coming out. Um, it's been a pleasure.